Hey everyone, this is Krista from the Bitcoin Design Community. We are in here in the Bitcoin Design Guide Jam session number 57. Um, as usual, I put uh, put together a note document, which I already shared in the chat. And uh, there were some requests for topics to talk about, which we can go through. But before we do that, what other topics should we add? And then once we have our complete list, then we can um, go over things and time them accordingly. And you you can say stuff or you can just write it directly into the document. All right, I'll just add a little bit about the Wall Street case study. I'd like to talk about design uh, guidance as relates to descriptor wallet backups. Okay, I'm writing that right now. Uh... Yeah, in terms of the order, maybe we can just get the small stuff out of the way quickly and then uh, we have time for the more open-ended conversation. So, yep. yeah, there are two big ones here, it seems like. My one's pretty fast and efficient, so that's okay. so we're going to move one. that further up, maybe at the very front. Daniel, you did you want to talk about your issue around the backup page? Yeah, it might tie into to, um, the general uh, talk about updates, aka descriptors and stuff. So maybe we leave that to that section. Okay. Hey, Johns, do you have any topics to add to our conversation today? Here no. Just lurking, miss you guys. So just uh, listening in. <laughs> oh, John, so nice to see you. <laughs> Good to see you on here. Um, okay, so how about we just uh, go from top to bottom real quick? And uh, I put my issue, the guide in 2024, at the very bottom because it's such a big thing. And maybe that is even more of a conversation starter than something we have to discuss in detail. So, Mo, did you want to talk about the wallet scrutiny case study? So mine is fairly quick. Um, I have a Google document which is prepared around the Wallet Street UK study. Michael's taken a look at it. Christoph's taken a look at it. They've given some comments. Um, I'm now working on the images. Um, so I'll just do a quick share over here. The Wallet Street UK study was the... Um, we worked on this collaboratively as a community. Um, this is currently living in a Google document. So I worked on the images of this um, today, pretty much most of this morning. Um, so this is what it looks like. Pretty much worked on the four images in the actual case study itself. And then in terms of content, Christoph made a good comment that there was a discovery phase, which I then need to work on some content for that. But um, in terms of where I am now, um, pretty much is um, prepared the images for export quality. So just looked at the um, image sizes in the guide and then made that wider as Christoph suggested. Um, Christoph also had a question about this one, if these were the steps. So I added in discovery as a step, um, added in this sort of research image and then added in. So just worked on the images and then, um, yeah, we just love some feedback um, if you'd like to outside of this call, you know, read through the case study and um, have a look at the images. And then if you have any questions or any comments, just feel free to add them to the uh, to the Google document and then I'll just keep on working on it. And that's it. And if you have a passion for security reviews and, and testing yeah. reproducible builds, please join the project. Yeah, for sure. I'll drop in the, um, I'll drop it in here. So then you can have a look at the, uh, the case study itself. And that's it for me, short and sweet. So it, it sounds like you're getting fairly close to the, con you have the content structure, you're adding in the images, things are pretty well written out. So the feedback should be, sh should we already give feedback based on like tiny typos or still more just kind of how it reads and if it all flows well, where would you like feedback? I think just on how it reads and if it flows well and also tiny typos if there's any. Mm -hmm. um, 
of course, I still need to create the discovery paragraph, but I feel like I'm like moving it towards the finish line now. So it's kind of, I think, one maybe one more week of one more round of reviews, and then we can move it. Think about maybe moving it into a live page if that feels, feels good. Okay. Yeah. You want to have questions, feedback? Um, I did take a quick look at this, less the case study, if I'm being honest, than the redesign itself. And uh, I just wanted to comment that I, I really liked it. I thought it was a good job. I think there are some things that they as like a service could improve in like expanding what they're testing against. But design-wise, I thought it was excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, they, uh, they, that's why I mentioned it. They definitely need contributors to help with all kinds of different things uh, to expand all the stuff that they can offer, because it's a really tiny team trying to do a lot with very, very few resources. So anyone watching this on YouTube or Bitcoin TV, join. OK, uh, then let's hop to the next one. New code resources page. It's something that Daniel worked on and just pushed live. I'll pull it up here in my background. Daniel, did you want to talk about it? Yeah, just to mention it and I guess celebrate any any merge to the guide. Uh, it's been a long time coming, this one. It's not a big update, but it's valuable nonetheless. It, it just um, links to the various code libraries that exist for the Bitcoin UI kit primarily. Um, there's also some links to the Bitcoin icons kit and some um, example wallets that are using the reference designs at least you know uh, trying to they're in various states of implementation but still for someone starting out and trying to learn and trying to build i think the, these are good resources cool hey any thoughts questions ideas feedback This was so cool. Everyone's blown away. So yeah, this is something that ideally grows over time and and, and improves. And hopefully, it, it, I mean, a big thing is that this gets more visibility now to these libraries and makes it easier to discover. Because I, um... interesting point, I guess. Sorry, um, just to mention that you know this is straying into code. I mean, the, the, this is the Bitcoin design guide, but um, the guide caters for i guess two main groups it's either sort of designers coming into bitcoin and the other group might be bitcoin builders trying to up, up upgrade their design <laughs> so this is sort of in the in the in the gray area in between um so slightly outside of our normal kind of design fair and straying more into developer country but i guess the the, the whole point with the bitcoin ui kit and making it easier for developers to to um, to use it is that hopefully you get more good uh, patterns and design kind of for free. Uh, so that's that's also the idea with some of the wallet implementations, I think, or you know the kind of guides there is that we want to help people build better products faster. And if they sort of get some of the good patterns and the good design for free, that that helps everybody. Sorry to cut you off there. Please continue. Um, I was just going to say, as, as a developer and one that is not a particularly good designer, or or you know, has to spend a disproportionate amount of their effort making design because it doesn't come naturally. Uh, these tools, like this, is the first that I'm hearing about them. I'm so excited to hear about it, and I'm going to begin disseminating these and investigating this immediately. This is fantastic to a whole class of developers that are hobbyists, that are amateurs, that do want both this guidance and more than that, they want a handheld. And this is the handheld that, that they need. And I'm really excited to play with these tools, is what I want to say. Cool. Feedback welcome. Uh, I mean, they, they're all kind of in various states of uh, work in progress. <laughs> so, you know, um, feedback and help to improve them are, are definitely welcome. Oh, cool. All right, next one. Um, <clears throat> Multi-wallet reference design. 
Um, I, I took this out of draft mode um, Friday, I think, and I think it's ready for more review. There was a pretty long discussion around what this page even should be about and all of this stuff. Um, and I refined it and reiterated stuff. And now I'll just give a very quick overview and it would be awesome if you could take a look at it. So it's basically, you know, the daily spending wallet, it's like, this is lightning first for one specific use case. And that's why, why we can abstract everything away. You don't have to worry about everything. But there are those situations where people deal with multiple different buckets of funds that maybe have different ownership, different security, and then wallets need to uh, uh, allow for switching between them and managing them in parallel. And there's a description of the use cases and how the keys are organized, how to guide people towards setting up the appropriate type of wallet for whatever they're trying to do. Um, where to combine and where to keep things separate a bit. And then it touches on various different types of screens and how uh, multi-wallet management could be handled in those screens. Like, do you mix, do you have like one balance for everything or do you separate them out? Um, stuff like transfers comes in. That's obviously not a thing when you just have one wallet per application, you can't do an internal transfer. So that kind of stuff there, it's, uh, I feel like all of these flows could be, like this could this could have five or different sub pages to really flesh all of this stuff out in detail, but that's not really realistic. There's a lot of references to the daily spending wallet because a lot of times it was really just like, do what the daily spending wallet was, but with this one tweak over here. Um, so yeah, it was, it, was, it was interesting. So I'm curious what you hear and also, don't just accept that this product needs to exist. Question everything, <laughs> and then uh, you know, I kind of take it from from the top uh, with the idea. You know, there are tons of wallets that need these type of interactions and UI that do this. And here we can provide a guide for how to go about this. Even if some wallets choose to be more of a general purpose toolbox or focus on one or different types of wallets or just on Lightning, or if they do it with Cashew or Liquid or something else, they should still be able to use some of these patterns and uh, approaches. So that's that. Um, anyone has questions uh, on this one? Otherwise, we can just move on to the next topic and you, can, you are welcome to give I, feedback as you'd like. I did um, come in with a review on this one earlier and I've reviewed it again since. And I got to say, I, I love everything that you've updated on. I especially love the uh, alternative approaches and degrees of separation uh, sections that you've added. They really dig into the nuance and complexity and give give a, a broad picture of, of how you have this abstract way that you can structure your wallets as both a developer of a use case specific application and a user, you know, interacting with Bitcoin. I, I, I love the the page as it is. It's excellent. Awesome. Yeah, that's great to hear. I know we, we went back and forth a few times and you had some different ideas for uh, for the page that didn't quite make their way in, um, which doesn't mean that they're crappy ideas. They just might not be the thing that I was trying to do with this particular page and they might fit in somewhere else. Um, so just keep all of that stuff in mind and, uh, and uh, we can find a place for all of that stuff, ideally. Um, what type of um, feedback is useful to you at this stage? Just more like readability or? Yeah. So uh, if you have not read it, then you will have a first impression that you will never have again. So just your mm -hmm. first reading through, it's like you look at it, you're like, I don't, I don't get it. Like, What's this about? Or this is very intuitive. Or you kind of lost after the first paragraph. Your eyes start like, dancing over things. You have to reread it in order for it to make sense. All of those mm -hmm. things could be hints that it can be improved in some way. So just your first impression. Um, and then if you like to read it again, two or three times or so, if you look at a specific flow, if you feel like you have lots of questions, you need to look things up. I'm also curious if this works, this, um, um, the, all this referencing to all these other pages, if that even works very well because I felt like I was linking to all of this other stuff. And it's like, we'll go over here first and then come back and then we'll have a few tweaks here. Um, yeah, I don't know. I have a strong opinion that that's a very useful and functional design and you should keep doing it. Do, do you feel like that as a reader that 
that makes sense that I could work. It empowers me as a reader to choose whether I care enough to click on that link, and it gives me that option. And that is useful to somebody that's learning. And you know, you as the learner, you're parsing all of this information thrown at you. Vehicles with which to execute that parsing, like choosing not to click on a link or doing so, and not having to go dig, that's valuable. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I hope I hope that was helpful, Mo. And thank you. Yeah, I I already went uh, through it um, just before the call, and uh, I think definitely there's n I don't think there's uh, anything missing. I'd say the only uh, now that you mentioned you have to uh, that it's a hint if you have to reread something the degrees of separation section i think is very important but i had to read through it twice um but I, but i think it's it's exactly also that where um there is probably a lot of room necessarily for users to make their own decisions and it is, it's going to depend on what we um or it will depend what we want to actually recommend them to do because i was while I was thinking about, you know, kind of these more inheritance use cases, I'm not sure if I would add a, uh, even if it's just watch only, if I would add a, an, 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 like 99% or 95 of my, my savings into a multi-purpose application like this, just because it might be, you know, dangerous or it, it, it's more risky or whether to keep these kinds of funds separate. But in the end, it's it's just one other wallet, right? And users will, they will decide themselves what they will do. But um, yeah, I think I think uh, this kind of degrees of separation, that's probably where there is going to be a lot of a lot of nuance. I think everything else is, is I mean, as is, I would, <laughs> I would merge it probably. Also, these self transfers or t transfers between uh, the own wallets, I think, and the archival ones, I think that's it's it's great. Yeah, th yeah thanks. The so the inheritance thing, I was also wasn't sure whether to put that in. Um, I mean, the the idea was to come up with a a scenario that you can imagine is realistic, but. That is maybe not necessarily realistic, but on the other hand, the it's uh, it's like a um, it's like a reference, and it's meant to show various different types of configurations, and that's where you're like, okay, sacrificing realism a little bit for the sake of having a comprehensive um, uh, set of different wallets in this you know, on this page. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's I think it's it's. Um... It's good to show that you know the range that's possible or could be possible, and everything. I mean, users will have to make their own uh, determinations. But yep. yeah, this is. I think this the separation uh, section is is a very tricky one too. If you come up with a better title, let me know. I wrote like ten different titles for that one. That's why what I ended up on. Yeah. No, I think it's it's very very important in this context. Okay, cool. Um, sorry, what do I happen here in the chat? Oh, John's had to hop out. Okay, awesome. Cool. How has to get back to Legends of Lightning business? Taking care of that. Okay, cool. Next one, Michael. Do you want to continue with uh, stuff around Miniscript? Yeah, and. Um... If we have time, I made a little prototype um, that I would be curious to just get a first reaction on before I put it uh, somewhere out there. So if I share my screen, where is that? Here. Window. Sigma. OK. It's visible. Not discernible, but visible. Um, so basically, what I um, what we discussed is whether um, or uh, we discussed these kinds of uh, recovery 
uh, key sets in this Miniscript uh, How It Works page. And uh, we discussed the idea to put it into the, or either as a, as a kind of a section in the savings wallet page, um, or I was thinking, or I started thinking whether it wouldn't be better to have to have its own page because it it impacts basically the onboarding and recovery and all these things and might be not the best uh, uh, approach to kind of over complicate the savings wallet page. But that's kind of an, an open discussion. What I wanted to show is um, what I did is basically I I just used the normal or let's say the default setup for a multi key wallet uh, similar uh, to what we already have with uh, these different keys that you can set up in this case three and then I kind of embedded this recovery key set use case in there and if I switch to the prototype so basically that's where we we take uh, um, where I thought it might be good to have it is when one, let's say I've set up these kind of the, the, the keys for my two or three, uh, I get asked, um, do you want to create a recovery key set or a recovery path? Or that's also, that's also some of the uh, language that still um, I'm kind of torn on. But the idea being basically that you can, um, that users would get a question whether they uh, want to create a recovery key set or whether they want to skip it and just use the uh, the wallet as is. And if they say, uh, if I say, should I, maybe I, uh, I make it bigger, fill the screen so that might be better. Um, I say, yes, I want to continue creating a recovery key set. Um, I would see my default key set um that i just created so this is my two or three that's uh, always available or yeah wording is <laughs> something to be worked on i would see the names of of uh, my keys they could be maybe even kind of swipeable if they get too long or they could just stack uh, that's kind of a uh, detailed uh, design decision then and i'd be able to just add recovery key sets um if I if I say add one, um, and this is again going to be very dependent on the product or the team that is wants to implement this uh, these kinds of things. But uh, what I would probably encourage or do is um, kind of start with the with this kind of idea of decaying multi sig to make um, to make suggestions. So once I click this guy here, uh, I see the keys that I have. Here, uh, I see uh, I can change the name of this uh, of this key set. I can uh, I get by default uh, a decaying thing. So this is the key key scheme would be one of three. But I can go in and I can I can change these values. And one thing that I'm 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 might want to do and that's also something for for feedback is um what happens if i want to use other keys than the ones that i just that i just added right so it gets it gets a little bit more more complicated so i would need to have some kind of follow-up um flow to add let's say a fifth key or a sixth key that i mean it gets it gets more complex, but the idea being basically that I can I could select if I have more than three keys already. So Nunchuck and all these other uh, wallet coordinator softwares, you can you can basically add an n amount of keys that you can use in different combinations. So you'd be uh, selecting uh, by default. We'd select the same three keys that are in the default key set, uh, and I can unselect or reselect any of them. Uh, yeah, so I can change the key scheme. Um, and I also um, have to be able to edit kind of this uh, unlocking mechanism. So meaning um, when 
should this be unlocked again, we could say here are the defaults. If my wallet was not used for six months, then unlock the recovery key set. But, and this is, I didn't prototype this out yet, but uh, we could also, so this is basically it represents a relative time lock, um, but you could also say activate this, this, this key set on November 30th, 2027. You can, <laughs> uh, and um, so you could switch between these types of um, wallets or these types of, of rules. And one thing, uh, I think it was originally Christoph's idea, which I actually liked. I mean, ideally I would be able to set reminders um, that remind me, hey, uh, like five, five days or a week before, um, something activates uh, that it activates so I can I can take action. But that would mean that either the app has to keep somehow, I mean, if it's in the app, then you could keep track of this of this time. But uh, if it should be portable to another uh, wallet or a configuration software, that might not be not be possible. So you maybe just have a, a calendar. It would just generate a calendar input uh, invite or something like that. So this is something that I haven't figured out yet or thought too much about because it's probably not the core of the of the uh, of the use case. But it could look something like this, right where you say. Uh, remind me seven days before, three days before, four hours before, or these kinds of things. But it's probably not central to the to the experience. And if I say, okay, this looks good to me, uh, I'm going to save it. Um, I would just see kind of another uh, key set that um, gets stacked below here, maybe, you know, will depend visually, it could be like a timeline. Uh, there's a lot of ways how to be, how this could be designed and you can add additional uh, recovery sets uh, to this. You could theoretically also um, add, another, uh, add one key set that is a, a single sig or one of one that is also it's kind of like an emergency key that you store somewhere, you know, very deep of it. But it's, um, yeah, it's, I think for this, for the sake of this use case or for the reference design, maybe kind of this simple um, <laughs> decaying multi state use case might make sense. And that's what I was working on last week. Maybe that's that, just pause for, for comments. That's amazing, Michael. Holy crap. Yeah, looks really good. Thanks. Um, in terms of your, at the very at the very beginning, you were talking about, I think, what, how this fits into the guide. So I, if I remember correctly, you said one thing that it could be part of an inheritance reference design. The other thing was it that it could be its own reference design that because it relates to other ones, like right now in the in the we have reference design, we have daily spending wallet, savings wallet, upgradable and shared. And then multi wallet would go in there and this could be called recovery wallet or recovery key set or, or something like that, where it's like, okay, these other wallets up there. This is another feature that you can add in, and this page deals specifically with the setup of these and how they appear in an application that supports them, similar to what I'm doing with the multi-wallet page. Um, yeah, maybe it's worth just writing those couple different options out. And if you're, if this is the first thing you're going to work on without having the inheritance stuff done yet, maybe it can live in one place earlier now and then it moves somewhere else that's also totally fine we have to rearrange things anyways um and for the for the content it looks really good i had one challenge for you could this this specific interaction that you showed be a single checkbox so i want to have let's say i want to have a so it, in what you showed it's i can configure everything and i have to figure out what i want to do with it if 
this softening security that says after X amount of time, maybe only one key is needed, could that be just a checkbox? Like, hey, here's a feature. If you want to have this recovery, yes or no. And then I don't have to worry about anything. It's maybe pre-configured with a way that the user, that, that that's the experts or whatever uh, recommend that's a best practice. Michael, you're muted. Thanks, Mo. Yeah, of course. I mean, it, that, that's exactly what I think the kind of the focus of the. I mean, in the in the end, how much do you want your users to be able to override things? Right. You could mm -hmm. you could just say here's here's the default option. Do you want it? Yes or no. And it adds it immediately. And then you might be able to kind of hit, a, hit a, an edit button and then configure it. And here it is basically this a similar thing where you have kind of one more, basically one more tap. Because when I say add, then I see a pre-configured option. I could just hit save and it's there. Yeah. Uh, so just that I that I uh, what I thought was. Um, um, might be helpful is if if I see kind of this review of, of an overview of what is being activated mm -hmm. before I actually activate it. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that was that was the thought. But of course, I mean, if if uh, if uh, you, you know, the other one is also. also yeah, it, it, it's a it's a little bit similar with with the multi wallet thing. Right? Do you do you give people all of the options, or you do? Like what I ended up doing was I asked people, you know, how much do you want to store there? Is convenience and low fees important for you? Yes, no, and then it's like, oh, you should use that one, and you can change it if you want. But the yeah. you start with with like a bit of a templating before, and then allow people to dig in. With so it's essentially the same stuff. It's just one comes in front of the other rather yeah. than the other way around. Um, yeah, I have, I, oh, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no. It's good. I, I, I got the gist of it. I have, I had a very similar setup, um, or kind of this, like initial set of questions, uh, like uh, Christoph has in the in the multi wallet page, um, to kind of get a feel for what people might want. Yeah. So definitely work on that. Mm -hmm. It's really good. Excited. Yeah, I, I really like your design, Michael. It's just I think what it does really well is it helps to prevent the user from making mistakes, and I think that that's something that is very much needed is to help prevent users from making mistakes, and that's what your design does really well. The just the whole the whole essence of it helps people from making mistakes. There was one thought that came up. Um, I know you know maybe if this becomes a page, but. <clears throat> Something that came to mind is although the use case might be may, might be clear to us, it might be nice to think about um, like maybe just write something about like a use case like this is the person and I don't know this is how they're going to practice yeah. practically use this exact word, user flow you know it was just something that kind of came to mind. Um, it might also help to think about things in the user flow that maybe you could miss you missed or or you could add or anything like that. Yeah, so that's it pretty much. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I the it is currently um, in in this concept you could set up the the exact thing that is on this how it works page. So this kind of model in, enables exactly that. And um, while I was thinking, could this be just you know be a subsection of the savings wallet page? I think. It might be better to separate it um, to its own page, maybe as a as a sub page of the savings wallet, because there are many many uh, similar things. Um, but yeah, so that's I'm gonna I'm gonna have probably just have to um, try it out and, and and we'll see. Yeah, amazing job! Really nicely done. 
Yeah, there's a bunch of detail to get into too, like the, the key, it doesn't apply to all funds at the same time, but it's UTXO specific. So the key might work yeah. for 12% of your funds, the recovery, but not for the other 88% or so. so yeah. stuff there. It's, uh, I deliberately left that out for <laughs> now, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a tough one. Well, Mr. Genome is very enthusiastic about your, <laughs> your design. Is there, Michael, just a last question. Is there, how can we help you and provide feedback? If you, do you want to drop the link for the Figma file and we just comment in there or what's, what's useful to, for you at this stage? Um, probably I'm going to do the same thing uh, that Christoph did uh, with just, you know, opening, I'm going to open a branch to see where it might fit, to, to start working on it. Uh, and um, the Figma file, I'll probably share it kind of by the end of the week or something like that. So the goal would be to have something um, that is a bit more structured by the end of this week. Sounds good. All right. Well, um, any other questions or thoughts? on this one. And otherwise, we can get into design guidance around descriptor wallet backups. And I think Daniel mentioned his issue might be related for the backup page. So Mr. Gnome, would you like to introduce? Yeah, um, this can be fairly quick. There is a example print template page in the manual backup page, uh, part of the design guide. And it includes uh, a 24 word slot for your, the user to write in their words, but it also includes a QR code for a single descriptor. And that got me thinking about a couple of things. The first is that I don't think it's appropriate to print a descriptor. Uh, printers have caches. I don't, I don't generally want to send my plain text keys to a printer. Uh, and that's what I understand that QR code is. It's a single spend descriptor. Um, also, I, I want more than one descriptor in my backup guidance. I'm not sure what the solution is to this problem, but I'm really interested in what people have to say or would brainstorm about how do we effectively set a standard for backing up a multiple descriptor, descriptor wallet? Because right now it's basically just like you, you've got a file. It's We're, we're almost going back to uh, the old wallet.dat days in terms of how we handle these backups. And I think that it's an opportunity for a lot of design innovation. And it's also incredibly necessary from a security standpoint that we we be giving guidance on this issue as we move forward into these new wallet formats. Does anybody have any thoughts on what an appropriate way to guide developers and users to back up a descriptor wallet might be beyond simply the storage of a, a file. Um, let's start at the top. So I haven't looked at this in some time. So the output descriptor, I see an XPUB in there. So there's no private key there, right? And then there's the fingerprint. Then there's the derivation path. Derivation path is something that's often asked for that it should also be given. And then I don't know what the what the B3FX at the end is. Yeah, you're right. That is a pub, an X pub. So yeah, there are there are no descriptor keys there. Yeah, so you would so that's probably restoring it as a view only. I would assume yeah. then. Yeah, I, I would think. So I know Blue Wallet allows you to do this thing where you can, I think they can do descriptors, but you can have a view only. And then if you try to send from it, then you can upgrade it or whatever you want to call that, migrate it, change it to by entering the recovery phrase or whatever you want to have, right? Maybe that is that is the idea. I just don't exactly remember anymore from when this page was created. Um, but non nonetheless, the question still is if you have like what's a good way to deal with descriptors because it's not really human readable. Like anyone will make mistakes if they, no one can remember it and everyone will make a mistake if they try to type this. 
Um, so I'm going to pretend I'm five years old. Could someone please explain what a descriptor is? OK, I've, I've been waiting for this moment here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the glossary page. I think it's here. Uh, there's a little comic here. <laughs> so, you know, basically, you know, you know, the recovery phrases, right? You're yes. like, oh, I can type that in. But actually, there's some information missing. And what the wallet does, it like it guesses a bunch of times and it tries to find find your 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 uh, your um, your Bitcoin, like your addresses that were actually used. But in that process in there, it's like, it just tries a whole bunch of stuff. And that's not really that great. So a descriptor, it's, it's basically like a code function that in, includes your recovery phase. And it can include that other information that's needed to specifically instantly get to your specific addresses and funds to avoid this kind of guessing that's, it, it works, but it's not necessarily pretty and it can do more work. complex Don't setups. Don't say things like that, Chris. It doesn't work. Well, it works well it's... enough for now, but... You, in, users in... needed to know their derivation path if they're going to use BIP39. They need it. It's it's necessary. They have to know it. That's why it's a really good thing it's on that document. Well, I've used them without having those and it's been fine, so maybe that's... Do you want to guess about where your Bitcoin are? Be my guess. Yeah, it's, I mean, for, for Mo and also for my own uh, refreshing a memory, I didn't hear about descriptor wallets until I started trying to build with BDK. Um, but it's, I think it's both true, right? Like um, the recovery phrase is like a master key to uh, any amounts of doors. You just don't know how many uh, will have anything behind them so that's why a lot of wallets have implemented this kind of like all right we'll just try the key in all the doors we can find and see if we see anything behind them uh, and that's sort of like the uh, the brute force of making a good user experience from that so i think it's both both are true it kind of works but it also is scary that it's not specified in a better way um but yeah they're, they're not very they're not very uh, user friendly obviously the descriptors because and you can have many different descriptors connected to one recovery phrase if i'm not wrong right like you may need yeah. several um, and let's not even bring up the gap limit like how far are you going to search down a given derivation path like that's your gap limit. What if there are transactions beyond that? At some point, you just stop searching. Right? Yeah. And like uh, the, the comment right now was that, what if the wallet doesn't check every door? Yeah, that's completely right. Like um, a wallet that was built five years ago might not uh, even look behind some of the doors that have been <laughs> built afterwards. So um, I think if we step back a little bit, you know, the question is, if you're building and, and you know the, the guide and, and our work is mostly focused on uh sort of end user ready wallets that a lot of people are expected to use so like there's a lot of niche cases that we don't really cover today um but assuming we're, we're thinking about a mobile wallet that someone wants to start building today Right. What is the best practice here that we could recommend, both in terms of um, creating the keys, in terms of duration paths, etc., but also like yeah, in terms of what what information should that brand new wallet present to a user when it comes to backup information? And I think we we've been stuck in a little bit of a place where, well, we just do what the other wallets we have used to do. Um, but many of them were started to be built, you know, five, six years ago. And so, yeah, I think there's probably a, a, a good case to sort of re-examine, like, what should we be doing um, while there is a lot of stuff that people are doing or a lot of wallets are doing. So, yeah, I'm kind of curious as well. I don't know what the answer is when it comes to descriptor wallets and... Um, 
and I wonder, yeah, Mr. Norm, do you have any suggestions? What what kind of do you think like a user friendly consumer wallet should be doing uh, when it comes to sharing uh, backup information? It's it's so difficult. Um, I think that you know Michael's done a great job of showing us today an example of a complicated subject spending paths like that could be applied to multiple wallets and be applied to multiple descriptors like that kind of ui could be applied to a lot of things because it's just an expression of the general way in which bitcoin works you know it's these scripts that unlock your utxos and allow you to sign transactions and and spend them and providing users an interface where they can delineate a whole bunch of different scripts and ways that they unlock coins that's incredibly powerful I think the way that we approach descriptor wallets is going to require that kind of innovation. I don't have any good ideas about how to do it. I do. I've seen people do QR codes in metal. It's not pretty. It's error prone. I don't like it. Um, I do think that learning from what we know about you know, backup solutions already. We know that certain kinds of metals are appropriate mediums for data. Our data obviously needs to be very error proof. Like deformation shouldn't impact the data integrity. Things like old school barcodes, maybe. Um, I don't know. I, I would want to do some research into uh, low density, high integrity mediums of data storage. Yeah, I mean, uh, the descriptor contains, as far as I know, it contains the private key, right? Um, yeah, the, actually, this is my sort of edge, the edge of my knowledge. I'm not sure if the descriptor contains the recovery phrase or just a private key as in if you know your descriptor could you extract the recovery phrase but then it's also also contains the derivation path right is there anything else uh, i'm pretty sure it'll be like whatever the arbitrary spending conditions of your path like if it's a multi-sig it'll be all of the pub keys and your own private key, say, for the wallet construction for your wallet. If it's uh, it, it's a BIP32 HD wallet, like, you know, is core standard, it's going to be the, the XPRIV, the extended private key. Um, and I think that that's what you see. And then, yeah, the derivation path on the end there. Um, Michael, maybe you remember this page. I can't think of it at the top of my head. There was um, There's a page that has all these examples of descriptors uh, using Miniscript. What is Miniscript? CH and I don't know, it was something like that. But a bit descriptor, it's it's basically like a function with a bunch of variables. And you can put all kinds of stuff in there and can be a bunch of different functions. So it can be, you can just have an XPUB in there. You can just have your recovery phrase in there. You have your XPRIV. You can have a multi-sig. You can have three recovery paths in and it gets super long. Like it's a very flexible thing. It's like, just like, like here, a function and some variables, and you, you just use that, and that's how you come up with uh, the addresses and everything. Um, so yeah, it's very powerful, but it's also not very readable. And uh, right. in terms of interfaces, the trick is because it is so powerful, it's like, how do you build a, a UI around it that can understand all of this stuff and make it easy to interact with? And one of the ideas there was like, you, well, you just don't, right? You, you pick like common use cases and you build UIs for those, and then you have a fallback where where you know it's a little bit more hardcore, but it's, ideally it's not used that often. So it's a very, very flexible thing. And just one more point: uh, I think there's there's probably a data hierarchy, right? I can with just the derivation path, I can't do anything, right? With the recovery phrase, I can do something. I can brute force. Then I also have uh, for Lightning, I have channel backups for multi-sig. I have like how the keys are brought together. Like there's a hierarchy of the of, of how sensitive the information is. And then for some non-sensitive information, it's probably totally okay to just put it in in a cloud backup. Uh, if the user, if cloud back is something that the user feels confidently about that they will have for a very long time, because that's not also uh, always a given. 
that that would be my starting point to figure out how to how to work with this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I mean, I was thinking about it as, as well a little bit yesterday, uh, last week, because I talked to Stick about that exact problem. Um, because <laughs> we had a look at the, you know, if you if you have a, a multisig like this mini script descriptors, there is no way. I mean, reading it on a on a on a on a laptop or on, on a mobile phone is one thing, but if you import a descriptor. Uh, and you you want to enable kind of your your treasure or your bitbox or whatever you scroll through endless uh pieces of uh, or strings of um uh text and there's no way you can you can actually determine i mean or it you could but it takes you an hour to <laughs> to really verify stuff and not get lost so com kind of i was thinking if i could see whether we could kind of visually componentize these things like where you have a different visual appearance of xpub versus the other thing or or fingerprint or kind of yeah make it a bit more more modular that you at least don't get lost uh, or or kind of have visual anchors somewhere but uh, yeah it will it will take some experimenting yeah i think it's fair to say that both the kind of backup flows of most wallets and the recovery flows you know i think it's it's not surprising if they they have sort of been, been designed once or you know they, they 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 get updates a lot less regularly than the the rest of the wallet um and it's probably similar with with the guide Right. We we could do we could do a new uh, review of uh, of what we're looking at. You know, so I started that issue about uh, the backup page, but that is slightly separate from the use case for that. It's more like okay, a person created a wallet with a with some kind of Bitcoin software, whether whether it was a mobile wallet or or something else, but the purpose of that page is to help them store that information as good as possible for their specific use case. But then we have other places in the guide where we talk maybe more directly to people who are creating a Bitcoin product. Um, so that's also another place where we need to review, like, what do we recommend them to go to the user and same for the recovery flow. So I'm happy to create another issue for, for that use case. Unless someone can just solve it here and now on this call and we'll, we'll be done with it. <laughs> I'm also just going to show the next call as well. <laughs> There's a call coming up in four minutes, which is a UX research call. And the focus is going to be on the research that was done on Bitcoin Core. So if anyone would like to join, I'll drop in the link and that starts in four minutes. So I'll be hopping off in. Slight side topic, but while, while we're on here, uh, Mr. Nome, you said, or you hinted at being a builder. Um, yeah, I'm really curious if you're building a particular kind of wallet or, or anything that you, um, yeah, yeah. I'd like to share about what, what you're working on. This is going to sound crazy to designers, but I am building a non-custodial uh, lightning uh, GUI, I suppose. It wraps around LND or C lightning. Um, it's entirely local in that it is an HTML file. It is just an HTML file because it runs locally and you're not supposed to serve local HTML without you know, a local web server. It uh, runs in an extremely security restricted context. Um, and it can't, for example, include other files uh, because it can't access the file system. Um, and it is an incredibly simple UI designed around enabling people to Anybody on any platform open up this HTML web page and 
It'll walk you through verifying and installing LND or C Lightning. Or if that's not your jam and you've read the reasons why you should do that and you disagree, you can press a button and it'll do it for you. And boom, you're ready to accept tips on any social media service. You know, Discord, Reddit, you, you just anytime somebody sends a tip command to you in DM or whatever, they are responded to with a lightning or a fresh lightning or Bitcoin invoice. It's like a self-hosted DNS layer like LN URL, except for targeted at kind of end users as opposed to web services. Okay. I, I, think, uh, I think I understand now why I got a random friend request from a, a Discord bot a few days ago. <laughs> Might that be it? Uh, no, though, no, those are scammers. Okay, I am scammer. constantly okay. and frequently impersonated because I do a lot of onboarding. Yeah. And so because people inappropriately trust me, scammers try and abuse that. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying. That's pretty cool. A little bit like what Mutiny Wallet is doing, but uh, more use case specific and even more restricted, right? Yeah, it's it's incredibly restricted, and uh, it's just because it's so it it is entirely self hosted. It works on a socket layer, so you don't like open up any ports. Uh, the user, like you, the person running this HTML file, is the one making all the outbound connections. Nobody's ever making incoming connections to you. Um, it's just it's got a lot of properties I like, and it's a design direction that nobody's really taking. Uh, this incredibly like I can't express to you how lightweight this UI is. The idea is that you should never have to run the UI except for if you really want to see all the buttons run headlessly. But yeah, and then you know, people on I run a Discord server over there and people over there or on Twitter or wherever can just lightning tip each other and it'll serve privately invoices to each other. It's very nice because uh, right now in, in the Bitcoin Design Discord, we have a Zebedee bot in there, which I don't think anyone's really aware of, but <laughs> would be cool to maybe test out another option there. But the core research call is happening right now. Um, everyone else, you're free. To, you're welcome to continue. I'm going to hop over there because I told Mo earlier this morning that I will help. So I'm going to... Thanks, everyone. Stop the recording. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for the conversation. Continue, let's continue in Discord. See you later. So, I, I won't be able to make the call. I have to get my daughter from school and do the pottery class. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Well, thanks for tuning in. We'll stop the recording now. Thanks for watching.